So good evening and, and um, welcome to the annual lecture hosted by the, the program in critical curatorial and conceptual practices in architecture. Um, as co-directors of the CCCP program, Makusura and myself, are very, very pleased to be um, welcoming uh, Martin Beck to speak tonight. Martin is a, an artist based here in New York whose work has long stood as a, as a paradigm of the type of uh, critical nuance and conceptual and historical rigor that we hope the CCCP program uh, might foster within architecture. So moreover, it's work that for, for a long time, and I'll speak to some of the ways it does this, has engaged directly with or even drawn from the fields of architecture and design, uh, notably including the history of exhibition design, an uh, uh, obsession that uh, Martin, Mark, and I all share. And his work often takes exhibition design as a sort of format, we might say, or mode of practice that might be subject to systematic modes of scrutiny and artistic refunctioning. Additionally, some of his artworks have taken the form of architectural interventions, recently such as Remodel of 2011 with Ken Saylor, which was a redesign of the, the Goethe Institute's um, gallery at 30 low, uh, 38 Ludlow, Ludlow 38, uh, a wall of 2012 at Artist Space Books and Torx. So I wouldn't be so uh, imprudent as to uh, claim Martin for our side of the fence, so to speak. I do want to underscore the importance of this uh, architectural trajectory uh, throughout his work, actually both in exhibition apparatuses, but also in content. And we see it in, in, in early exhibitions like Outdoor Systems, Indoor Distribution uh, with Julie Alt of 2000, which engaged with super graphics and megastructures uh, and the work of figures like AkiZoom and Super Studio and AkiGram. Or exhibit, uh, sorry, an exhibit viewed, played, populated of 2003, where we find figures like Rainer Banham and Charles Jenks as key protagonists. Or another exhibition, The Details Are Not the Details of 2007, which took George Nelson's strut tube system uh, as a key archive uh, uh, of mid century exhibition practice through to panel two, nothing better than a touch of ecology and catastrophe to unite the social classes, which was installed among other venues here at the Arthur Ross Gallery in 2009, and which drew on Rainer Banham's involvement uh, in the Aspen Design Conference, and I could go on and on uh, to bring us up to current work. And I've often said that, that seeing or, or, or reading Martin's work is sort of like finding uh, a wormhole or something onto a parallel universe uh, in art, a, a sort of position from which somebody like myself can look back at my own discipline uh, from a sort of parallax view and with a heightened intensity that for me remains continuously fascinating uh, and enormously constructive. Uh, but I did want to say that the crucial here is not only um, the figures like architecture, design, and exhibition uh, making have remained uh, important archives for Martin or sort of sites at play within his work, but, but equally important is that we pay attention to the incredible precision with which he selects and reactivates and transposes uh, and translates aspects of that visual material um, into his work. So architecture and design, we find, always don't come into play merely as stylistic or even semiotic tropes, let alone as functional ones, but as harboring methodological problematics, as vehicles of research into a medium or a practice, sort of vehicles that reveal something uh, of the works of its functioning, of these materials functioning within institutional frameworks uh, and cultures more broadly, um, but also always that insist on a type of um, profound internal heterogeneity within the material itself, even prior to uh, being redirected into his work. And, and it's this, in some senses, that uh, brings me to Martin's presentation tonight. As advertised, Martin's talk is presented on the occasion of a two-year exhibition project at the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts at Harvard University entitled Program, uh, a work that manifests or an exhibition that manifests as a series of episodes uh, across time, a series of, of interventions, installations, events, uh, and display. And I'm sure many of you in the room know that the, the Carpenter Center is a, a building designed by Le Corbusier in the early 1960s. Not that this is the subject of Martin's work. 
So as the poster notes, the poster for GSEP, and I quote it here, a program focused on the institution's uh, modes, formats, and sites of communication with its various constituencies, and drew upon the exhibition histories, academic pursuits, and institutional development of the Kabma Dissenter during its founding period in the 1960s. But, um, uh, uh, somewhat of a spoiler alert here, I might say, departing from the poster, Martin will not actually speak about the project. Rather, instead of, instead of describing the work as such, he's going to offer us an element of it, uh, presenting a, a script or a performance that constituted one of the final elements or episodes generated in this context. Yeah, so as you'll see, a sort of version uh, of an artist's talk. And I want to recall just very briefly a rather nice piece uh, of this story, which I think allegorizes uh, at once the proximity of Martin's work too, but also uh, its manifest distance from uh, something like design. As he explains in an interview related to the project, the initial invitation from the director James Voorhees was to, and I quote, uh, to re-envision um, as an artist the foyer area of the CERT gallery in order to accommodate a coffee bar. So instead of playing the role of artist as designer here, Martin headed instead into their institutional archives to come up with a very different kind of project. And in turn, uh, Voorhees named the, the platform which emerged uh, from this collaboration institution building, which now takes the form of an expanded residency envisaged as a critical mode of curating. Uh, and so we'll come back to that um, after Martin's presentation uh, to, to uh, open up what exactly that project was about. Out in, in a slightly different register. But finally, before I hand it over to Martin, I wanted to uh, announce that uh, in May of this year, Martin will be having a major retrospective of his work at Mumok in Vienna, entitled Rumors and Murmurs, um, which I hope that many of you will have an occasion uh, to view on, which I personally am very excited to be able to see over the summer. Okay, so please uh, join me in welcoming Martin to the podium. <laughs> Thank you, Felicity. <clears throat> An organized system of instructions. Rudolf Arnheim, professor of the psychology of art at Harvard's Carpenter Center from 1968 to 1974, begins his seminal book, Visual Thinking, with these words. Without information on what is going on in time and space, the brain cannot work. However, if the purely sensory reflections of the things and events of the outer world occupied the mind in their raw state, the information would be of little help. The endless spectacle of ever new particulars might stimulate, but would not instruct us. Nothing we can learn about an individual thing is of use unless we find generality in the particular. Evidently, then, the mind, in order to cope with the world, must fulfill two functions. It must gather information, and it must process it. The two functions are neatly separate in theory, but are they in practice? Do they divide the sequence of the process into mutually exclusive domains, as do the functions of the woodcutter, the lumberyard, and the cabinet maker? or those of the silkworm, the weaver, and the tailor. Such a sensible division of labor would make the working of the mind easy to understand, or so it seems. Arnheim continues to state his objective, to show that the collaboration of perceiving and thinking in cognition would be incomprehensible if such a division existed. the artist, the institution, the audience, the invitation, the presentation, and the resulting communication. Studio and kitchen table, exhibition space and lecture hall, the forms of interacting and the formats it creates. April 14, 2016. 
Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts, Harvard University, Cambridge, Massachusetts. An artist talk, episode nine of program. A program is defined as an organized system of instructions. Something organized has been put together in an orderly, functional, structured whole in a coherent form. A system is a group of interacting, interrelated, or interdependent elements forming a complex whole. Instructions compose a functionally related group of elements. They can be a direction to be obeyed, an order, or detailed directions on procedure. March 3rd, 2014. I am writing to say hello and to ask if you would be interested in beginning a conversation about, about participating in an exhibition in spring 2015 that would take the form of your envisioning and designing the spatial environment for a coffee bar at the Carpenter Center. On the third floor of the Carpenter Center is a defunct cafe space that was introduced into the architecture during a renovation in the early 2000s. The space, adjacent to a gallery, visible through walls of glass and situated beautifully at the crest of Corbusier's concrete ramp, is approximately a thousand square feet with a large terrace overlooking part of Harvard Yard. The space has extraordinary potential to become a vibrant social site, an important extension of the exhibition programming. It is a perfect location for a coffee bar. The initial plan is for this design space to exist for at least two years before another artist is invited to reimagine the space. A defined site, a defined role, a defined time frame, a defined way to perceive and to act based on how the work I have done has been perceived. To design a space as an artist, a functional environment, to provide a function as an artist, to take on a role by crossing into an adjacent field of practice. Can one operate as a designer without being one? Do I want to operate as a designer? In between, here, there, not here, not there, one and the other, both but not. Disciplines and to be disciplined, crossing over, crossing into, trying to learn as much as I can. Coffee comes from some of the most remote places in the world and there are a number of key environmental preconditions that allow for the creation of incredible coffees. Altitude, diurnal temperature range, adequate sun exposure, good rainfall, and healthy soil are all critical factors that make great coffee possible. Despite being somewhat puzzled by the idea of designing a coffee bar, I accepted the invitation out of curiosity to where it might lead. Two months later, I spend time at the Carpenter Center. In conversation, I learn about details and desires for a new beginning. Different possibilities emerge with more specifics and less of a frame. The coffee bar slips into the background. The institution as a whole becomes a possibility. Time is a possibility. Uncertainty is welcome. Rethinking the invitation a larger terrain. Recently, when combing through a collection of work resources I had been assembling for a while, I read in a 1970s book on new forms of communication. The trouble with knowing what to say and saying it clearly and fully is that clear speaking is generally obsolete thinking. Clear statement is like an art object. It is the afterlife of the process which called it into being. 
The process itself is a significant step, and especially at the beginning, is often incomplete and uncertain. I'm thinking about my own process in relation to clarity, about the crossings attempted, the blurring that might have happened, thinking about a rule that I made for myself a long time ago. In order to engage with and draw from various bodies of knowledge and practices, every crossing into a different field has to be accompanied by an exchange. If I take something, I have to give something back. An ethics that defines the seriousness of the engagement. I wonder about the relationship between process and objects. And I am aware that most meaningful exchanges are not about objects. During the first visit to the Carpenter Center, I was shown through the building. Highlights and idiosyncrasies of the Le Corbusier architecture were pointed out to me, as were its various spatial functions. I took in the sites of activities, some curricular, some social, some administrative, some relating to exhibitions, some public, some private. A building in which aesthetics and function are meant to come together in a culture-producing machine. The Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts, a belated modernist institution representing the persistence of the modern dream. In the exhibition staff's office, a mountain of boxes sitting on the floor. The 21 boxes contained the archive of the institution from its inception to now packed up in folders, binders, and boxes, documents, photographs, and artifacts, concept and position papers, discussion notes, memos, letters, lists, events, exhibitions, celebrations, ideas, research, curricula, communication, pragmatics, documentation, materialized time, an institution's past contained and ordered. Mm -hmm. May 22, 2014. Thinking about how to start the process, I thought to include you in my anything but formalized and maybe rambling stages of development and make our correspondence an initial site for engagement. So as I collect and work through notes and thoughts for myself, some of it might appear off topic, incoherent, cluttered, but bear with, bear with me, take what is useful, ignore the rest. I see this as an experiment for myself, a thinking out aloud, figuring out a way of working that acknowledges details of a process that is full of uncertainty and meandering, rather than one that returns to tried ways of doing things. I will be sending you things over time, some written, some images, some other, some personal, some research, some casual observation, sometimes lots, sometimes very little, sometimes nothing. A collection of materials and fragments that accompany and enable the project. What follows? Tests and trials, conversations, requests, proposals, discussions, assumptions and impressions, do's and don'ts, rehearsals and returns. Another beginning, the introduction to Charles H. Kepner and Benjamin B. Trego's 1965 book, The Rational Manager, A Systematic Approach to Problem Solving and Decision Making, describes how the authors developed their consulting method. First, they reviewed the literature on problem solving and decision making, looking for techniques and concepts or principles that might explain the difference between good and poor decision making. They found bits and pieces, but precious little that they considered useful. 
Then they examined the internal workings of an organization, from policy level to accounting procedures, looking at its complete operation. But those details did not help in finding concepts that could be used in solving problems. Sitting in Trego's garage, they spent hour after hour trying first one idea or technique and then another. But nothing worked out to their satisfaction. Then one day, they completely reversed their attack and decided to start with a, with a problem of a company and work backward through the process of solving it, dissecting the thought process involved at each step. In order to begin to reverse the attack and work backward, step by step, starting where something else ended, to see and to think, to learn, to collect, to visualize, the lasting and the ephemeral, to act by making visible. When, in 1851, John Adams Whipple first attempted to capture a photographic image of the moon through the new Harvard telescope, he noted that one of the obstacles to getting a clear image was the Boston-Cambridge atmosphere with its sea breezes, the hot and cold air commingling. When the moon was viewed through the telescope, it had the same appearance as objects when seen through the heated air from a chimney in a constant tremor. Pressure, heated air, refractions. Decisions always lead to a change of course. Two of the main concepts of problem analysis. One is that every problem is a deviation from some standard or expected performance. And the other is that a change of some kind is always the cause of a problem. The situation. I learn that a change is wanted by the institution's new director. If change is brought about by problems, as Kepner and Trego argue, my task then, as the invited artist, is to cause a problem. The initial invitation requested an exhibition participation as the artist who not only acts as a designer, but as an artist who changes a component of the institution, who, as designers do, solves a problem. But in order to effect change, in order to not solve a problem, but to cause it, a different mode of engagement is needed. One has to construct an artist's role that departs from the familiar crossover script of the artist as designer, a role that challenges the institution by inscribing a new character into a tried and true narrative, a role that potentially ruptures the cohesion of the artist institution audience comfort zone and rattles whatever the planned exhibition was supposed to become. What would it mean to explode the exhibition itself, to scatter it through space and time, to reduce its presence to a ghostly character of being there and not at the same time. A different image, a new character, a new plot line, the tension between clarity and tremor. After spending a few initial days with the 21 boxes, I wrote down the following observation about the early decades of the Carpenter Center's archive. The composition of the archive of the CCVA reflects a similar inconsistency as its exhibition and lecture program. Whereas the exhibitions of the first five years are ambitious in scope and visuality, an institutional exhaustion seems to take root after 1970. Similarly, the archive files from the early years are not only comprehensive, their composition also points to larger ambitions. 
The archive boxes of that period document the tremendous research effort that went into the development of the early exhibitions. And the keeping of every note of this process exhibits a belief that this work has greater historical significance. From the mid-1970s on, the files offered only scattered information. No rules for archiving seem to be in place. The same can be said about the CCVA exhibition and lecture program. One archive, two scenarios. A, considering every single note scribbled on a scrap of paper as having historical significance. B, considering hardly any note or paper trail as having historical significance, full of details for one period, empty for others. How to think of the relationship between an institution and the documents it keeps, the volume and form of archival documents, their presence and absence as a reflection of focus, ambition and self-image, to be there and not. 25 Bialtrexgasse, Vienna. Adolf Loos orders all the documents in his office to be destroyed as he leaves Vienna and settles in Paris in 1922. All investigations of Loos have been marked by his removal of the traces. All of the writing is in, on, and around the gaps. 8 to 10, Square du Docteur Blanche, Paris. Le Corbusier decides very early on that every trace of his work and of himself should be kept. He saves everything, correspondence, telephone bills, laundry bills, bank statements, postcards, legal documents, family pictures. The immensity of the materials available has generated a series of mega publications. How is absence a form of forgetting? Is the archive a supposed remedy for this? Or does the archive actually allow us to forget. How is presence a form of remembering? Is the archive a supposed remedy for this, or does the archive only allow us to forget? A new beginning. During the summer of 2014, I spent extensive time reading and looking at the papers and images in the Carpenter Center archive. I transcribed, wrote down notes, I scanned documents, took photographs, and asked for more information. I record, I duplicate, I understand, and I don't. A thought, maybe the problem, to metaphorically use the structure of the archived institution as the project's content, to exhibit a form that is abstract at the core, a form that reflects the relationship between the institution, its memory, and the symbolic sites of its public interfaces, about how and where an institution builds and communicates with its constituencies, a form without a form. The artist talk is a popular format to relay information about an artist's work and to institute a relationship between artist, host, and audience. It is generally expected to see works an artist has done, and to hear the artist speak about how artworks came about, to get insights, to get explanations. From an institutional standpoint, the artist is asked to mediate between artworks and their public understanding, to show and to tell. <clears throat> Utilizing existing channels of communication can wipe out a statement. There is a widely accepted misconception that media merely serves as neutral packages for the dissemination of raw facts. Guests on television shows accept invitations to appear on programs in the hopes their messages will reach new and wider audiences. But even when they are treated in a friendly manner, they generally come away with a sense of failure. 
somehow the message transmitted is far removed from the message intended. Preparing this lecture, I kept wondering if what is said at an artist talk only fulfills a supplementary function of the format. Speaking about art and explaining its intentions and meanings can certainly produce insights and allow for a deeper understanding. But since we've heard that clear speaking is supposedly obsolete thinking, and that clear statement is the afterlife of the process which called an artwork into being, I'm thinking about the role such a talk plays in the overall project. An artist talk also brings together the physical bodies involved, the artist, the artwork, the institution, and the audience, a convergence that is meant to further desire. The benefits of being there and the challenges of not being there, presence and absence. My work at the Carpenter Center has been mostly ephemeral and has produced very little to nothing in terms of a tangible object trail. The official framing of my engagement at the Carpenter Center has been billed as a residency under the banner of institution building. So I ask myself, have I really been there? Have I really resided? Or who or what has been residing? What has been built? From what I am told and from what I have experienced, my engagement has garnered interest and curiosity, for which the work's focus on the institution itself was certainly a factor. But what about the project's ephemerality and my almost clandestine presence or absence? Perception and memory. To reside, to have one's permanent home in a particular place, to be situated, to belong by right to a person or body, to be present or inherent in something. How does one speak about a body of work like that? And how does speaking constitute what that work is about? I've learned a lot about the institution's history, its ambitions, its protagonists, I've witnessed how the institution has been repositioned. And, of course, I have developed artistic ambitions for the project myself. But what narrative to tell? What story to invent? What script to follow? What directions to create? The form and the format of narrating one's work. Narratives easily multiply to reflect on how something came about in the process of engaging with it. Edward Seckler, founding and longtime director of CCVA, introduces his and William Curtis comprehensive 1978 study of the center's genesis and architecture as follows. An act of artistic creation cannot be re-enacted. We may make it less mysterious through study, but not less mythical. It remains dependent on myth because every creator lives by myth, public or private. When form, motivated by myth, is treated as something autonomous and is imitated in its external manifestation, it loses authenticity. The result is formalism, meaningless except perhaps as an interesting, even beguiling historic phenomenon or symptom. But when form is studied with a view to understanding the conditions of its genesis, the results of such study, concerned with the structure of form and the form-giving process, will be meaningful beyond the limits of the individual case. Consequently, the documentation of a form-giving process and its results may serve a double purpose. On the one hand, it may yield clues to the nature of the underlying myth. On the other hand, it may contribute to a better understanding of the way in which creative work is done. Here, 
are those two words, creativity and form. Creativity, the artist's imperative. Form, the artist's challenge. Studying an archive leaves one with knowledge about how certain forms came about. But those forms don't lend themselves to be implemented in the present. Forms are represented in the archive and those representations live in the archive as ghosts of past activities. Obviously, the archive itself has a form, a form that is not only material, boxes, folders, papers, but an organizational form that is more difficult to take hold of, to describe, to visualize. That form emerges in the process of engagement over time. It is based on relations between what is tangible and what is intangible, what is there and what is not. The form of a project and the form of its representation. All of us are thinkers. However, most of us are surprisingly unconscious of the process of our own thinking. When we speak of improving the mind, we are usually referring to the acquisition of information or knowledge, or to the type of thoughts one should have, and not of the actual functioning of the mind. We spend little time monitoring our own thinking and comparing it with a more sophisticated ideal. In his 1974 book, Conceptual Blockbusting, A Guide to Better Ideas, the Stanford University engineer and design teacher, James L. Adams, introduces the phrase thinking form. Thinking form is obviously the form thinking has or takes. Adams argues that identifying and understanding that form would lead to better ideas, to more creativity. My computer dictionary defines form as the visible shape or configuration of something, a mold, frame, or block in or on which something is shaped, a particular way in which a thing exists or appears, a type or variety of something, the customary or correct way <coughs> of uh, pr producing, a printed document with blank spaces for information to be inserted the state of an athlete or sports team with regard to their current standard of performance. The 1960s lit and early 70s literature on productivity enhancement speaks obsessively about creativity and in that context specifically about two things, the relationship between problems and solutions and secondly, group processes. Problems are thought of as things to do away with, they are what needs to be solved in order to get tangible results, as solutions seem to come easier when attempted in groups. The literature argues the messy aspects of collective work processes need to be smoothed out, and everyone needs tools for that. Through the use of various forms of listing, and by consciously questioning and striving for fluency and flexibility of thought, it is possible to improve considerably one's conceptual performance. One of the most powerful techniques of enhancing one's conceptual ability is the postponement of judgment. The ego and superego suppress <clears throat> ideas by judging them to be somehow out of order as they try to work their way up to the conscious level. If this judging can be put aside for a while, many more ideas will live until they can be seen. To see and not to judge, but to select from what emerges to be seen. To select, to take a choice as a choice from among several to choose, to pick, to pick out, to make one's choice, to decide for, to elect, to single out, to opt for, to prefer, to fix upon, to settle upon, to put aside, to lay 
aside. The 1972 book, The Universal Traveler, a soft systems guide to creativity, problem solving, and the process of reaching goals, is a homemade quirky instruction manual with a countercultural flair that is set on demystifying the creative process. The book's authors, Don Koberg and Jim Bagnell, describe short, compact tasks that anyone can pursue. Dozens of exercises unfold within the book's overall trajectory, diagramming a big spiral that ends close to where it begins, a round trip. The Universal Traveler offers ways to assign value or worth to process, ways to decide from among many options, ways for taking action on a decision, ways to broaden the field of choice, ways to determine a point of view, ways for getting to know the problem, ways to get started. The spiral and the return to cause a problem, the problem of form. Among the constellations of the night sky, some are little more than an assortment of dots, a bit of, sp of sparkling texture, accidental in character, and hard to identify. They owe their unity only to the empty space around them. Others hold together much better and display a definite shape of their own because their items fit into an order. The seven brightest stars of the Ursa Major are seen as a quadrilateral with a stem attached to one of its corners. Here, the perceptual relations go much beyond connection by similarity. What is seen is indeed a constellation in which each item has a definite and unique role. Because of its graspable shape, the constellation can also be compared to familiar objects of similar visual structure, such as a dipper, a wagon, or a plow, or an animal with a tail. Its relation to neighboring constellations is established by further structural connections, since two of its stars point to Polaris, and its tail leads to Arcturus, the bear watcher. Form is emerging as a relationship of parts. Depending on which parts one focuses on, different forms emerge out of a constellation of elements. Le Corbusier's notes and sketches for the design of the Carpenter Center repeatedly refer to the metaphor of the institution as a breathing apparatus. If looked at in plan view, one might read the building's ramp and the floor parts alongside it as an image of a windpipe flanked by a pair of lungs. For Corbusier, lungs have metaphorical significance as a model for the city whose air and traffic circulate freely and whose greenery and open space allow it to breathe. The creative person must be able not only to vividly form complete images, but also to manipulate them. Creativity requires manipulation and recombination of experience. An imagination which cannot manipulate experience is limiting to the conceptualizer. This game is called breathing. Let us imagine we have a goldfish in front of us. Have the fish swim around. Have the fish swim into your mouth. Take a deep breath and have the fish go down into your lungs, into your chest. Have the fish swim around in there. Let out your breath and have the fish swim out into the room again. Now breathe in a lot of tiny goldfish. Have them swim around in your chest. Breathe them all out again.
At the end of the first working document sent to the director on May 22, 2014, I wrote, a term, program. Rather than start the engagement with a curatorial request or the physical site, the coffee bar, the more than obvious Le Corbusier, start with what makes the invitation possible in the first place, the anchors and rituals of the institution as it defines and reveals itself in its own archive. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. In his 1962 book, The Shape of Time, the art historian George Kubler points out that original forms in what he calls prime objects are notoriously difficult to identify. Those objects, he speaks about artworks of the past, are often only known through mutant replications, analogous to the experience of dead stars. We might know of their existence only indirectly by their perturbations and by the immense detritus of derivative stuff left in their path. Kubler uses the term form class, which resembles a broken but much repaired chain made of string and wire to connect the occasional jeweled links surviving as physical evidences of the invisible original sequence of prime objects. His emphasis is not on the objects themselves, but on connectivity, on the string and wire that hold together the objects. A 1963 working document titled A Program of Action for the Next Three Years, Preliminary Draft for Purposes of Discussion, Confidential, lays out ways to deepen the educational experience at the Carpenter Center. An integrated program is more than a sum of individual courses, excellent as they may be. Integration is brought about by an agreement on the part of all participants in a program to accept certain common goals as giving a general direction to the joint effort and by a willingness to make certain adjustments and modifications in individual courses in recognition of the common goal. Genuine integration or coherence of a program cannot be brought about by administrative action. It is a matter of underlying attitude. Program is a collection of episodes that began in October 2014 and concluded with an exhibition titled 50 Photographs at Harvard in the summer of 2016. Although self-contained and non-sequential, the individual episodes connect the institution's sites of public interface, the press release, the physical space, the exhibition, the educational mission, student and visitor relations, artist talks, lectures, and a collection. They focus on the institution's interactions with its various publics and how, in the process, it, consti it constitutes itself as an amalgam of education, presentation, and conservation. This talk was episode nine of program. In medicine, Episodes are distinctive and separate events that are part of a larger series. The term episode is especially used to describe the occurrence of a usually recurrent pathological abnormal condition. In television, episodes in a series build and continue a larger narrative. Although part of a sequence, they are written and directed in a way that one can enter the narrative at different points, without having seen all the previous episodes. Familiarity with the plot lines and characters certainly allows insights into the nuances of a serious development, but it is not a necessity for understanding individual episodes. In most television series, the longer the series runs, the more the narratives multiply. Not only do stories and characters develop more fully, 
New characters are introduced. Unforeseen relationships emerge. Plot lines detour. Edits clash forwards and backwards. Time expands and time contracts. Television and medicine. Departure, departures and returns. Question. What does an evaluation of a trip usually reveal? Answer. Measures of achievement, need for improvement, plus the fact that the process never ends, that destinations are merely rest stops. Looking back over a completed journey is a mellowing experience. The good times and the bad tend to fuse together to become a single memory or general impression. Such general impressions are merely accented by those most memorable experiences encountered. Minor pleasures and acquisitions are as easily forgotten as are some difficulties and sub-problems. As we lose sight of the small experiences and begin to remember only the major ports of call, we set ourselves up once again to forget the joy and reality of process orientation. We recall our total multi-event experience as but a series of products and destinations. Ten episodes, removed and applied, 1963, integration of the program, a report of the committee, the photographer and the city, reality is invisible, the limit of a function, a social question, an organized system of instructions, 50 photographs at Harvard. Let's begin again. As the project is now in the past, questions of form and format lead back to the archive. What is left? And how does what is left speak of what there was? What would be the documents? What would be the documents that program can leave behind? What objects can be kept? What would be the form and the format of such a repository? Or should any attempt at documentation take a different route, bypass the archive, and find yet another format to remember and or to forget? The relevant unknown behaviors are experimentally demonstrable only in retrospect as existing in between, but not off or in any one part. The synergetic behaviors of a plurality of parts are inherently unpredictable. Rehearsals and returns. Sequence is a fiction and what follows may have produced what went before. Thank you. Thanks all for coming out. Thanks, Martin. Um, clearly an astonishing, um, interesting and challenging talk, um, <laughs> um, especially because in part it addresses the contractual relation between artist and audience and between institutions and guests, which is reenacted here for us. Um, but, but I want to, in, in an attempt to work through that, underscore the complex of terms, references, associations from program to archives and their structure to exhibition practices to buildings such as the Carpenter Center, as well as all of the interactions and, and effects among those um, components. Um, I, I want to underscore that 
All of these are questions and issues that, as Felicity pointed out, we attempt to address in CCCP, so um, it's hard to imagine a more fitting speaker. Um, and, and not only because of the content and all of those components, which you so brilliantly uh, manipulate, but because of the form of your talk. And, and so clearly, I think we all understood that form is, is at question here. Um, and, and, and not only because of your talk, but because it's the term concept orientation or disciplinary predilection that you are most directed toward in this project and talk. And, and so I, I want to come back to the relationship between form and institution. And you've given us various ways in which you can think about that intersection. At one level, it feels to me that you are raising the problem of form of the institution for the institution. Meaning, if you assert yourself as the artist who doesn't solve a problem, but causes a problem, that problem is form. But it's not the problem of artistic form as we might conventionally understand it. It's the problem of institutional form. And, and, and so it seems to me that part of your project is to try to grasp or delineate institutional form, and, and in that you think of, you tell us about the form of the archive, you, you speak through various voices which program the institution, and those are notions of form. And, and these are clearly not the same form as the coffee bar as a form, meaning a problem-solving form. It's a different type of form. And, and so I guess my first question is to ask you to speak a little bit more about that construction of institutional form and how it is and is not or how it is similar to but dissimilar from the building in which it sits mm -hmm. and separate from the exhibition practices in which it participates and takes its distance from and, and how you think of the delivery of that problem and the reaction to that problem through the institution um, and whatever that meant at the Carpenter Center. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, let's maybe try to find like an answer through uh, like the form of the institution mm -hmm. in relation to the form of the project mm -hmm. yeah because I think there's there's one aspect where I think the two come together and overlap to a certain degree yeah where all these ten episodes yeah they each one of them attempted to index one of the sites of how the institution itself tries to speak, tries to address like an outside of the institution, yeah? So like uh, the press release, like one of the episodes was uh, 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 the sort of we produced an exact facsimile of the 1963 original press release that the Carpenter Center had sent out and just mailed that out to the current uh, press uh, contacts, yeah? Which of course <coughs> like produced some uh, sort of confused bewilderment yeah, of <laughs> like not knowing if people got an original document or what is happening as such. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but there was like one of the episodes, another one was uh, student relations. Yeah. How does the institution welcome new incoming students? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where one of the episodes included like gifting uh, something to all the new incoming students. Yeah. And so between these 10 episodes, I try to identify like uh, these, like, they're not even like sites, but modalities of speech, yeah? Mm -hmm. And none of it is sort of like, like more or less physical. You can't quite make like a place for it or a conventional object type form. But what I was interested in like making that, I mean index might be even a too strong a word, but making that collection was that uh, I thought form is something that emerges uh, once you put all these different points in relation. Yeah? So form is something that's more in between these sites than rather at a particular site. Yeah? And the same way then the project uh, was structured yeah? in, this, uh, in this episodic uh, setup yeah? that, uh, as I mentioned, sort of I was interested in, in that sort of double meaning of the term, yeah, of like a, a medical condition, 
uh, like an epileptic episode where this institution suddenly does something that is out of character, <laughs> yeah, and at the same time you build a narrative yeah, mm -hmm. around it, yeah. And so that's where like these two forms come together, yeah, but it's not a form in the, in the sense of like an object has a form, it's not like a shape or mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's form more as a as like Kubler describes it, yeah. Uh, like in his uh, sort of chain of detritus that mm -hmm. is just like there, yeah. And you can never quite say, oh, this is the form. You're always like close to it, but it like the minute you think you have it, it escapes you again, yeah. Just I have a. Um what I imagine is a, a sort of straightforward question about the, the way in which the discourses on rational management and, um, and creativity uh, enter into this picture. Because it seems in many ways that they are, uh, I mean, obviously they're operating within your, uh, your performance of the, of, the, of the artist talk as a modality of speech, but they seem to come from outside of the, the research on this particular institution as such. And listening to you, I was wondering whether they were symptoms of the, um, what you call the sort of out of timeness of, of the, um, of the you know, Bauhaus derived carpenter center sort of pedagogy and, you know, and the whole sort of institutional framework that, that's been sort of thrown forward from the, from the 20s sort of into the 60s right at the moment as you know, I've heard you say before that that type of um, thinking was, was largely redundant. So I'm, I'm wondering if they are I, don't, I, I mean, is, are, are these sort of just um, pieces of, of, of discourse from the outside interrupting this, or are they, or are they things that remind us in a sort of powerful way of um, things being in and of their own, out of their time? Because they, you know, they they have that similar type of almost sort of irritation-like quality to them in their mm -hmm. in their technocratic. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, they, we sort of love them for that entering into your. Discussion and yet they do you know what I'm saying? So I wonder yeah, what the yeah. status of those discourses are and what they're, how they're coming in within a sort of reflection on this modality of speech uh -huh. and if they're a sort of equivalent um, um, uh, traces of something from outside in the in the exhibition or in some of the other episodes. That, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they they operate in both of the ways that you describe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like on the level of. Uh, what the project does on an artistic level, but also uh, in relation to Harvard at like the time in the 60s, mm -hmm. yeah. On an artistic level, of course, it's uh, going back to the original invitation. It's an invitation as an artist to come there and perform creativity mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the institutions, yeah, to, okay, here's a situation, like, mm -hmm. you're the artist, do something, like, give us a coffee, give us, like, a coffee bar, and it's going to be a better coffee bar than an architect or a designer would do, added because, artistic content, I think yeah, it's like the artistic <laughs> surplus <laughs> as such, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, and I was interested in that relationship, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, also, like, coming out of a, like, generation of artists where, sort of, like in the 90s where everyone was like talking about like doing projects and only doing project mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. projects based on a specific invitation on a specific situation yeah and then always like being in that role of responding yeah and of course it's this classic uh, creative imperative yeah mm -hmm. that uh, the institution puts on the artist but also that the artist puts on oneself in that situation yeah so that was like one aspect that I was interested in and also just trying to understand like these imperatives, yeah. But at the same time, most of the uh, sources that I used in the talk, except for that Stanford one, was all uh, research that was done at Harvard okay. in the mm -hmm. 60s and uh, early mm -hmm. 70s, yeah, specifically at, uh, at like the business school whatever it's called, yeah. Uh, like this, the example, the, rash, the <laughs> rational the manager, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. rational manager was published by Harvard University Press, mm -hmm. yeah. And it was like research done over many years from like the late 50s on throughout the 1960s, mm -hmm. yeah. At Harvard to like improve sort of, yeah, creativity, mm -hmm. yeah. And some was even done at the GSD, yeah. Uh -huh. The were the were those books also 
in circulation at the Carpenter's Header? I mean, maybe not exactly those <laughs> books, but it seems like there's a discourse on communications and problem solving, which one would not locate so far away from the Carpenter Center at that time. So, so it also feels like you find that strange moment of convergence around questions of problem and form and how they're articulated. And, and that's a curious Harvard economy between the business school and the mm -hmm. Carpenter Center um, that, that's worth thinking through, I suppose. The, but the, I, I keep coming back to this because you know, we're asking students to do this, right? And to think through what an institution is, how do you see it, how do you, what are the signs, what is the archive of an institution, what are its programs, what are its modes of performance? And, and the one tack you threw, took through this question was around the difference, I think you were speaking of the archive, between its tangible and intangible effects. And, and there's something about the institution being haunted by by what, by text like this, by voices, by earlier programs, by earlier exhibitions, and there's something about the after effect of that haunting that I think is interesting. But I keep trying to understand what that reading of the institution is in relation to the format of your talk, if mm -hmm. that's the right term. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the strange, eerie glow of colors <laughs> and, <laughs> and the kind of managerial vocabulary or creative vocabulary that's on the screen. And so it's like we don't know whether to locate you as a speaker, this as the piece, you speaking through the creativity of those words. And, and I feel like there's a kind of institutional tension that, you, that sparked through that strange relationship. It's, it's ambient, it's atmospheric, it's not jarring, and yet mm -hmm. it's and kind of intangibly coloring everything that you're saying. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm just wondering if you can speak more about the, what visual dimension of the piece there was evidence of here. Uh, if, if that's the right I way mean, of phrasing I think that, that, yeah. that tension that is, I think, the core of the project, mm -hmm. yeah, of uh, that of always uh, like oscillating, yeah, between being the artist that performs a specific function for the institution, yeah, it's just like, okay, sort of to like not be the artist who comes in and then de the delivers like the, the institutional critique as such, mm -hmm. yeah, but sort of, okay, integrating into the artist, uh, into the institution, it's almost like becoming the institutions, mm -hmm. yeah, the institution, but then at the same time, like inhabiting these different modalities of speech, yeah, of mm -hmm. speaking, like, as the institution, but also speaking as the creative person, like, mm -hmm. and never settle on one position, yeah, and sort of try to literally create this uh, sort of atmosphere of unsettlement, mm -hmm. yeah, that you describe, yeah, uh, of where you don't quite know where where is one speaking from, yeah. Uh, so I wonder just maybe um, before we open it up to um, the audience for questions, um, see if we can get you to start to answer the what is left question. I mean, so I know that you know some some traces are quite literally left. So the you know one of the episodes was um, removing the cladding from around the the gallery that had been inserted, you know, into mm -hmm. the you know to actually create climate control and, you know, to institutionalize the gallery as a, uh, as a space within the Carpenter Center. Um, and, and, and that was a piece, you know, drawing on Michael Asher, obviously. Mm -hmm. but, but that remains, yes? That, mm -hmm. that, that's not, doesn't, never reverted to its previous mm -hmm. um, thing. And, and likewise, um, you're working on a publication, yeah? I mean, I'm just, mm -hmm. just wondering how we, to think about mm -hmm. those remains, uh, the sort of literal remains, let's mm -hmm. say, or the, the afterlives, because the episodes, um, you know, had a temporality that that you know stretched the the temporal scale of an exhibition to the point of it, sort of it failure to cohere, yeah, mm -hmm. intentionally as a as something like an exhibition that would mm -hmm. start here and go there and mm -hmm. have a series of components. Um, um, but there are traces, yes, and I'm wondering um, if the uh, I mean, some of them were decisions after the fact, yeah, mm -hmm. like not to I presume not to reclad the gallery, but mm -hmm. the, the publication that, that's coming in its wake is, um, um, I don't know, is the sort of re-territorialization of the project, and how are you beginning to imagine that it could perform anything like 
um, yeah, some of the machinations of, of the particular episodes. Yeah, I mean, it'd be almost um, an impossible challenge for a publication yeah, as a mm -hmm. device. And so I'm wondering if that's um, I mean, how you're imagining that and how you're... Like the short yeah. answer is it can't. It can't, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I mean, we've, like, the publication has been in the works for like the last six months mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. entering the design stage now. And uh, like the ambition really was to do something like that. But the more we uh, sort of worked on that, and the more we came uh, up against the, like just the constraints of mm -hmm. what is mm -hmm. a book, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the more difficult it became, yeah. This, uh, I wouldn't say like it's it's not going to do it like uh, mm -hmm. at all, yeah. There there is an element to the project that literally was out of the public view uh, or will be out of the public view until uh, the book comes out, yeah, mm -hmm. which is like a, sort of a, a set of like over 30 PDF documents that I uh, generated in the course of the two years yeah, mm -hmm. that the project ran and sent at uh, irregular intervals to the director of mm -hmm. the institution. And basically just as, a, as something to, for me to think through ideas, but I wanted like him to be involved and have responses mm -hmm. to it. And the book will have, like a big part of the book will be those documents, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're, they talk like about preparations for some specific episodes, but they also just uh, suddenly this material in there which are going to be quite baffling yeah? <laughs> because they're literally like sort of you cannot make a connection mm -hmm. to the project uh, other than that I was looking at them at, at that material exactly at the same time when doing certain other things mm -hmm. yeah uh, and that like from what I can tell right now is going to be it's quite interesting how it works with the like just photographic and textual documentation of what uh, the book is going to be, yeah. Oh, and the artist residency, that also remains, yes, as a yeah, after yeah. weird afterlife. It's I mean, that is the lasting thing, mm -hmm. yeah, where in order to make that project possible, the director of the institution, he had to uh, construct a format, a more yeah, familiar format, which within yeah. which he was able to to host me there over time, yeah. Because like whenever I went there, it cost money, yeah, <laughs> for the train, for the hotel, mm -hmm. and so forth, yeah. And he needed like he needed a container for that, mm -hmm. yeah, because that because that's how institutions work, yeah. It's like budgets have to be allocated <laughs> to certain things, mm -hmm. and they have to have a name, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he came up with the idea, okay, it's going to be an artist residency and it's going to be called institution building, right. yeah. And although, like, I mean, I went up there over the two years, maybe, like, 10 to 15 times, mm -hmm. but it, it was like, except for at the beginning, it was always like a day or two, yeah, mm -hmm. to go over practicalities because after the first, like, two one-week visits, I pretty much had like the whole archive like mm -hmm. scanned or photographed so I didn't always need to go there like physically <laughs> to, to look at it yeah and mm -hmm. uh, I became like this this ghost yeah mm -hmm. in the institution that everyone in the institution and around was always talking about yeah mm -hmm. my presence and the project there but I was hardly ever there physically mm -hmm. yeah and that also became like Sort of almost like a light motif mm -hmm. for uh, for the whole thing, and I really enjoyed that idea of being a ghost in the institution. Yeah, of always like being there, like as a spirit, but mm -hmm. not being there mm -hmm. uh, as a physical body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like the physical trace of that episode one. Yeah, that removing the removal of metal mm -hmm. cladding and just sort of smoothing out like the walls. It's like, except for a little label, there's nothing there, yeah? And that will stay there, mm. at least for the foreseeable future, yeah? It's funny, I remember I was heading up to Boston on a regular basis last, um, last year in the middle of this, and 
and I think I said to you, oh, you know, uh, sort, of, sort of what's up now? You know, what should I go and see at the Carpenter Center, you know, as part of your project? And you said something like, well, you, you can go, but you probably won't notice anything, or you probably won't see anything. And so the, the ephemerality, yeah, was sort of also met by, or the ghostliness was also met by this um, withdrawal almost into invisibility, which I think, mm -hmm. um, so in a way, the, the, the book, the, what's, the book will be the most visible, yeah. although, oh. yeah, the, yeah, the least, I mean, ephemeral little sense, mm -hmm. trace of the, of the event, yeah. Do we have any questions from... Uh, can you repeat the question yeah, when you have the yeah. microphone? Being a historian is to speculate. Would you agree on that? Or what's the difference is between, to speculate, between yeah. an artist's approach, as you do, and a historian's approach mm -hmm. to the historical material? What do you consider to be the difference in it? Uh, it is to speculate, yes, because every like, history is a fiction at the same time, yeah? But I think the, the practices and the methodologies to generate those fictions, they're slightly different. I think one has a little more license as an artist, yeah, uh, to construct fictions, yeah? Because the, the forms and formats in which those narratives are told are broader, yeah? Whereas, like, history is mostly written, like, is it written, yeah? Whereas, like, as an artist, you can do things that are not written, yeah? <laughs> in addition to the script that you yeah. presented today, in there addition are other to write, aspects yeah. of it that yeah. are not written, uh, yeah. No, but it's interesting also, um, I don't know, that doesn't really answer your question, but one thing that always strikes me about um, uh, this project is the incredible economy of the archival traces that you use, so, we know, yeah, you went into the archive and Jim sort of talks about you being buried in the archive and, and, and you come out with, um, you know, one press release or something, I, yeah? <laughs> I mean, no, no, it's interesting that, I mean, a historian would probably feel an obligation to mobilize more evidence to make a case or something and, and you manage to sort of lev leverage evidence in this very different type of way. Yeah, sort of, um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think like, uh, uh, sort of a telling example of that difference is like in one episode mm -hmm. I presented like three documents uh, from the archive yeah mm -hmm. which were uh, three pieces of paper that were visitor tallies oh, these are great yeah. Ones, yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, it's just like these sort of yellow line mm -hmm. sheets yeah with mm -hmm. like lines on there and at first they looked almost like drawings because they were really beautifully done yeah and I found them like in a folder from around 1970. And then sort of looking further, like in the years after, they always had these visitor tallies in there. And I started to ask myself the question, it's like, why in 1970 do they suddenly start archiving visitor tallies? Yeah. <laughs> Did they not make them before? And just, uh, they were just not there, or did they make them and throw them out, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. And I, I realized, like, the fact that they thought it's important to uh, archive them uh, reflects, like, it's almost a, a shift in the institutional consciousness, mm -hmm. yeah? And I'm pure, it's pure speculation, yeah? Like, thinking, okay, they're suddenly, either they have like pressure from the outside to show that their mm -hmm. exhibitions actually have an audience, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, or or they, they feel that pressure, or but they paid they, somebody to sit and take yeah. attendance, in effect. And there, there's like a shifting of the mm -hmm. institutional thinking about what they're doing, yeah. And like what I did in the episode, I presented like those, first three sheets as drawings, yeah, mm -hmm. as you would like present drawings, yeah. And uh, that's sort of like a little element which I think, like as a historian, one would be hesitant to just show these without anything else, yeah. And it was like shown with a title, it was called like The Photographer in the City, which was this uh, 
exhibition uh, organized by the Smithsonian and put together by Charles and Ray Eames. Yeah? Mm. Uh -huh. mm. And so that's all you got, yeah, it was like the title of the show and these three like sheets uh, from one weekend in the show. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, yeah? Yeah. 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 Andrew. Hi. Um, so the material that you pulled from the archive um, came from no in no pattern, right? It was, it was non-linear. Uh, can you say that again? The material you pulled from the archive mm -hmm. was non-linear. It was, uh, some might have come before another in relationship to the episode. So some, something in the first episode might have come from the 70s, whereas something from the second episode mm -hmm. might have come from the 60s. So mm -hmm. there wasn't a sort of chronolog chronology to the... No, there, there was no chronological correlation between the episodes mm -hmm and the development of the uh, Carpenter Center. Right. Yeah. So um, with that sort of oscillating logic, um, how then would you approach the publication? Would you represent the episodes chronologically, or would you represent it with some other kind of logic that doesn't really mm -hmm. fit the archival mm -hmm. um, structure of 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. 80s, 90s? No, it's, uh, I decided to represent the uh, episodes chronologically as they happened and that became important insofar as like at the beginning of the project when I knew I'm gonna do this episodic thing I had no idea how many episodes there were or what would come yeah so some episodes resulted as direct consequences from uh, research done for early epi for, for earlier episodes, yeah. So I wanted to uh, retain that uh, sort of like temporal narrative uh, in there. Yeah. Caitlin, yeah. Um. I have a question about confusion, I guess, because um, there are two moments in which you were describing sort of bafflement, um, either from receiving the press release or from material in the book that might baffle the reader. And, mm -hmm. and I found myself sort of like delighted by this idea and wondering why, in a sense, like what is it about confusion that would be so effective? Is it that it makes you, um, you know, think about the press release more as a format? Is it that it makes you think about this one in particular, or is that it destabilizes the form of, of the book or of the press release in general. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you saw mm -hmm. bafflement or confusion mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is like with the press release and I think with other forms of confusion that might have emerged, it's, it's, a, it's an attempt to disrupt rituals yeah, that are sort of tried and true and everyone sort of sits in, yeah. But it's also something that I've become interested in like uh, a few years ago when uh, I'm teaching in, a, in an art school in an art and education department, yeah. And when I first started teaching there, like a lot of the thinking that went on there was, okay, it's like the function of art education is to explain things, yeah. And I started to realize that it's a very like bizarre way to approach it because mm -hmm. it doesn't like allow for any kind of openness, yeah. And I sort of kept making that case there for uh, sort of misunderstandings and not understanding being like powerful educational tools also, yeah. And that sort of became something that that have then like also filtered into how I think about presenting materials, yeah, where like in some episodes everything was explained, yeah, so it was like the perfect, like uh, under perfectly understandable project, and then the next one mm -hmm. is like, what the heck, yeah, is this, yeah, and to use these different modes of uh, like presentation and organization of materials and thinking uh, in the overall project to, it's almost just as much as I was thinking about indexing the sites the institution speaks in, indexing the, the ways in which you can make things visible. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Sort of like 
And that's where like Felicity in the introduction mentioned this interest in exhibition history that mm -hmm. I have and like display issues. That's something that comes from there also. Yeah, to sort of work with uh, sort of as like in the talk, there's like one line where it's about clarity and tremor. Yeah, it's sort of like you have both at the same time, and that's when it gets interesting. Yeah, at least for me. Yeah. It's like things I don't understand, yeah, mm -hmm. make me want to do something, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes it's productive, but sometimes it's also, it can also be frustrating, and that's the risk you take with that, yeah. But without the risk, like, what's, uh, what's there to discover, yeah? The, um, the TV analogy is mm -hmm. super nice. Um, it's like Martin Beck TV. <laughs> in, in 10 episodes, and, and especially because of the pathos of the figure on TV who has misunderstood his or her <laughs> relationship to media and thinks this is going to be some moment of transparent communication. Um, and so the TV episode is not that. It's, it's the episode of some misfire or failure of communication or misunderstanding of one's position vis-a-vis uh, media, and and so this so the episodes are media ten media and they're TV and it's they're misfiring obviously because they're <laughs> episodes they're misfiring for the institution but but I'm also wondering if they're misfiring for you are, are you like one of those figures who has been you know subjected to the inherent misfires and miscommunications of that media or or is it something you deploy is it you misfire the communication at the institution. Um, and, and then I wonder as well if, sorry, these are more questions again, but it's <laughs> so fascinating, if the 10 episodes are a TV series or whether they're an exhibition. Um, because, because I think we understand something about causing the problem to the institution. I think we understand something about not wanting to design the coffee bar, though I think we all want to see the design for the coffee bar. <laughs> um, but but I'm wondering where the, where the exhibition figures in this discussion for you. If, so if the institution we understand is under review in your project, is the exhibition format also under review? And, and what do we think of the, let's say, the conventional rituals of the exhibition format that mm -hmm. requires this type of misfiring mm -hmm. or disruption? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that definitely was like a big aspect of it to sort of think of different ways of uh, what an exhibition or how an exhibition can materialize, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it, in a way, it came out of a frustration also I had with like doing sort of a few exhibitions in a row that mm -hmm. uh, were like based on like you have a space, you do something for the space and you uh, you do your best, and they were all like um, I thought like good exhibitions, yeah, and I enjoyed them. But there was like something where I wanted like so what else is there? Yeah, it's like where where can you like stretch? Yeah, and in that way, sort of the idea of like time mm -hmm. was something that interested me because it's also with exhibitions you have like your five to eight week uh, mm -hmm. run and then it's done, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, it's sort of, it's all there, like at the beginning of that, and it all disappears after that. And I wanted something that, that builds like more gradually, mm -hmm. yeah, that also allows me to uh, experiment while the thing is already underway, yeah. Uh, so that was like the sort of suggestion then to the director, mm -hmm. like why don't we call this an exhibition, yeah, but it, it comes and it goes, yeah, mm -hmm. and sometimes there's nothing there, yeah, and sometimes there is something mm -hmm. there, yeah. At the same time, I was also interested in, like, thinking of what you actually see in the exhibition as something that's not so much based in the physical presence of things, but in uh, the relationship of one presence to another presence, mm -hmm. and even if they're temporarily uh, not there at the same time, mm -hmm. yeah, and sort of what does it actually accumulate to as a whole, yeah, 
And in that way, uh, sort of those two parameters were something that I was just trying to experiment with, yeah. A sort of dumb question. Um, so coming back to the what's left, is there anything, you know, from this uh, experiment in sort of exploding the exhibition, for want of a better word, or stretching it out, that, that, um, that you'll take forward into another exhibition? I mean, I, you know, it's such a specific project within the context of the Carpenter Center and its archive and the invitation. I mean, is there anything that, that can be extracted from this? For instance, I mean, I presume none of these pieces will be in the retrospective, or will they? I mean, is there any way of um, either... There is a, yeah. a video documentation of mm -hmm. episode nine okay. mm -hmm. that will be in... Yeah. Uh, uh, show at mm -hmm. Momok, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, but in terms of uh, any other thing that could be extracted, no, that's just it. I mean, it is, like, it was a big r sort of, I wouldn't say a risk, but uh, a conscious decision to, with quotation marks, to shoot myself in the foot <laughs> as an artist, yeah, mm -hmm. because it's, uh, for once, it was the project made it extremely difficult for uh, sort of press to understand what it actually is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there was never a "this is it" moment. Yeah, that mm -hmm. somebody could actually write Review about, it, yeah. which mm -hmm. also resulted in the project like not getting a single write-up. Yeah, <laughs> when it was like happening. Yeah, not even the Harvard Crimson <laughs> wrote about it. Yeah, and. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's like sad on one hand, but it also, like, I took it sort of, it exhibits mm -hmm. like the challenge mm -hmm. that that thing does, but it's also uh, sort of the other consequence is for, okay, I've worked on this for two years, mm. and I was like asking at the end, what do I have to show for it? Mm. Yeah, it's like, what do I have like an object trail, yeah, that can circulate in different ways, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, of course I don't. Yeah, uh, there'll be a book, yeah, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is limited to, limited to what it can do, yeah. But I have to say, like, weighing the options mm -hmm. of, okay, I could have, I don't know, developed a sculpture, done like a film or do, <laughs> do something, yeah, that is like there and is left over at the end. Uh, to me, it was just like more interesting, yeah. yeah? It was more of a of a challenge, more of a risk, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I've, I've learned more than I think I could have learned by just making like a, mm -hmm. a sort of a distinct work that inhabits sort of, uh, sort of material parameters that can circulate after, that it can circulate afterwards. I didn't really offer a sort of catalog of the different um, exhibition practices of, uh, that Martin's engaged in, but just, just talking here, I realized I should probably point out that, you know, in addition to exhibitions being, you know, a medium and a sort of site of research and all these things, that you've actually designed exhibitions as a designer, like, you know, I mean, as an artist designer. So, so it's not simply refusing the artist as designer that's the gesture of refusing the coffee bar. Yeah, I mean, uh, in a fun, I mean, it's partially that, but... I would have checked... Yeah. to that characterization okay, because yeah. uh, you're right. Uh, I've yeah. designed like, quite a I few know, exhibitions. Not as exhibitions. Yeah. Yeah, and I, but yeah. uh, there was always like a very clear line yeah. between yeah. the art pr uh, practice yeah. and uh, the exhibition design uh, practice. practice yeah. Yeah. And the, the biggest clarity was uh, on the level of economy. Mm. Where mm. as an artist, designer, you don't get paid what yeah. a designer gets paid. Yeah. If you're hired as an exhibition designer, you have a completely different feast. Yeah. You have I wasn't a trying to collapse structure. them. I was trying yeah. to yeah. suggest a type of typology to the yeah. point where uh -huh. even the Canadian Center for Architecture has hired you to design yeah. its exhibitions. As an exhibition designer. Yeah, yeah. as an exhibition uh -huh. designer. Uh -huh. yeah. No, no, it's a good, but your qualification. And, uh, yeah. I mean, I was... Like, yeah. sort of years ago, I was really interested in that distinction also, yeah. Yeah? yeah? And of course, like, whatever I learn and know as an artist mm. somehow figures into exhibit designs and, mm. the, and the other way around, yeah? yeah. But I was always adamant to say, okay, there's a clear distinction to yeah. that, yeah? Because yeah. 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 it's, like, the moment 
when uh, I started doing this. And the first few years I was doing it with uh, uh, a partner with Julie Alt, yeah. Uh, we got all these mm. invitations from art institutions, mm. like inviting us as artists yeah. to design like something they had, yeah. and I said, "Oh yeah, we we usually pay artists like a fee of like yeah. I don't know, five hundred uh, dollars, and since there's two of you, you get like two hundred fifty <laughs> each, yeah, <laughs> and uh, like the same job, exactly mm. the same job yeah. in uh, design economy." is yes. like a uh, professional has a completely yeah. different yeah. structure yeah it's hilarious do we have any other any last questions yeah jason mm -hmm. i mean i don't know actually even though i grew up around boston i don't know enough to really to say anything about this but just to ask that as an intervention and as um, uh, to pro you know to insert a problem to create a problem or to make an intervention or to disrupt as you describe what you're doing is also um, consistent with the spirit of the carpenter center right that mm -hmm. the carpenter center was always the sort of re pressure release valve center of experimentation and and zany projects and hybrid events and happenings and it was like the heart of the experimental community at Harvard that really was not welcome actually anywhere else at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's sort of problematizing but also like completely in the spirit of and consistent with and inspired by that history. No, is that fair or? I mean, I think it's a little more complicated, yeah, where you're, you're right on a certain level, but at the same time, the Carpenter Center is the solution to a problem that Harvard had in the late 1950s, yeah, which uh, was that uh, they thought, okay, the visual world is getting increasingly complex, and our students don't understand the visual world in a way that they can sort of handle it. So they thought, we need a program yeah, where students can also go. And the Carpenter Center is the result of that, yeah. Uh, and uh, as it was set up, yeah, and as much as it sounds innovative, yeah, with its look, they hire Le Corbusier, yeah, they establish like the sort of visual and environmental studies program, uh, they establish it after a classic Bauhaus model, yeah, mm -hmm. as if they would start a school in the mid-1920s after some of the Harvard people went to Europe and saw the Bauhaus, yeah. So it's like, it's a totally belated concept, yeah. But within that framework, yeah, they do experiments, yeah. They do like exhibition, they, they do experimental Bauhaus exhibitions, yeah. And in that way, like yeah. 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 yeah, they. Mm -hmm. I mean, they wanted Gergely yeah. Kepesh to be mm -hmm. the director for a while, but he didn't want to do that, so he did like, uh, a big exhibition there. And uh, that's where they were experimental. That's where they were disruptive. But like, if you take a step back, they were actually quite conservative, always, yeah, uh, in what they were doing, yeah. Is there an end point? Oh, sorry. Is there an end point to the archive? I'm just wondering maybe, um, you know, your experience of that institution was sort of after it had, um, uh, played this function and had somehow been, you know, liberated from this claim. And, um, but is there an endpoint in terms of the archival material that that participates in your project? I mean, is it? I mean, I, I focused mostly on yeah. the first ten years okay. because that's where the institution was most active. Yeah, and then it starts to fizzle out uh, in the archive, and then with it's almost like amusing, yeah. As the 80s come in, mm. uh, the only thing that is in the archive are binders of slides 
of artworks. Yeah? So it's like this classic 1980s <laughs> medium of documenting artworks. Yeah, 35 millimeter slides. Yeah, binders and binders full, like duplicates. Yeah, that they had to send out. Yeah, and there's nothing about like why did they decide to invite that artist or this artist. There's nothing about like programming discussions that they have. Yeah, and in that way. Like the archive keeps telling a story, yeah. It tells a story about like documenting in the 1980s, yeah, uh, as opposed to different kinds of documenting, yeah. Okay, um, uh, well, thank you again, Martin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, well, thank um, all of you for coming and thank you for having me, yeah. yeah. No, no, so let's thank Martin. Yeah.